Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, I am um, I'm just admitting everyone now to the uh, to the video conference um, because I know that uh, many of you are just getting started. Thank you for being patient. Um, I see lots of people waving, which is really wonderful. Thank you all for for tuning in from all over. Uh, all over the U.S. and in actually the world. Uh, my name is Chris Ahern. I am Director of Partnerships for Reach the World. And uh, before we get started and before I, I, I pass it over to our friends uh, that are currently on board in the, in the Weddell Sea, I wanted to go over a few ground rules. Uh, number one, we have a lot of classrooms following along today. Uh, I can unmute you when it comes time for the Q&A, uh, but please be sure to keep yourselves muted until now, uh, until then. Uh, also, like uh, this is also being recorded, so once this does conclude, uh, we will be posting it to YouTube for your partner educators. Um, it'll also go out later today with our weekly email to teachers. Uh, the third piece is if you can from your side, and, uh, and this includes our friends on board, on board the expedition, um, if you can take vid pictures or video from your side so we can see what it's like from your side of the screen uh, and please share that with us through both social media uh, and, and through email, uh, please, you can always reach out to us at educators at reachtheworld.org. We would love to see what it looks like from, from wherever you are in your classrooms. The other piece is that we do have a chat function. So if you have questions, uh, comments, concerns, Please, please feel free to use the chat function, especially during, uh, during the part where I'm speaking, like right now, um, as well as when, when, when Holly and, and the rest of the Weddell Sea Expedition guests will be, will be um, speaking. Um, the chat is a great time to do that. My colleague, Tim, he's already chatted, he's already put out a, a message in the chat right now. Uh, so please, uh, please use the chat and, and we'll, we will do our best to manage that. Now, uh, the other piece is, that's really important is that our, our wonderful friends in the Weddell Sea are in the midst of conducting sea trials. So uh, that means that the Wi-Fi may not be strong. We may run into some technological difficulties. So I appreciate everyone to be patient and understanding that the, that the, the signal may not always be perfect and that's okay because we're taking part in history and, and I appreciate everyone doing, uh, you know, being, being willing to, to Learn along with us as we as we connect with with uh, with all of you, uh, not just those of you on board the the expedition. Um, so, without any further ado, uh, I will pass it over to uh, our guests today for the expedition, um, and that is and that is our reach the world's traveler on board, Holly Ewart, uh, expedition leader John Shears, and Captain Knowledge Bengu. Uh, so let me just unmute you. Uh, where are you? All right. The you are unmuted. Feel Hello free to from start Antarctica. <laughs> Hello. Thank you all for following the vlog. We're so excited that we can actually connect with you in one of the most remote places on the planet, the Weddell Sea. Um, I'm Holly. I know most of you have been following my blog on Reach the World. Um, I'm, in, I'm here today with the voyage leader, John Shears, over here on my right, and our captain, Knowledge Bengu, who is very experienced in polar ice navigation. Um, so I thought we could start by just introducing ourselves. I know you guys have been following me and read my profile. Um, this is my first time in Antarctica, hopefully not the last. Um, it's an incredibly vast and beautiful place. You know, I wake up every morning and I see seals and ice and it's absolutely incredible. Um, I'm here to assist with the expedition, um, but I will pass you over to John Shears first, who has pretty much coordinated and is running this whole expedition. So. So it looks like that uh, our friends on board the expedition have momentarily frozen. We'll wait for them uh, to come back online um, in, in a moment. 
uh, so uh, like I said, we'll we'll do our best and and um, and hopefully uh, and hopefully get them back shortly. Um, so in this is a great time while we're waiting for them to to recon uh, to reconnect. Uh, this is a great time for you all to. Um, <laughs> it'll be this is a great time for you all to start thinking of some questions some ideas this is a great time to use the chat um, maybe you can all use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from I know that there's a lot of really amazing places all over the all over the country in the world that you are tuning in from uh, so if you want to take a moment to do that while we're waiting for uh, our friends uh, in in Antarctica to reconnect all right we have River Forest Illinois we have uh, Matt Nelson from Montana. All right, we have Illinois and Montana. Uh, I forgot to mention, I'm calling in from New York City. Uh, so. <laughs> oh, great question, great question. We'll, we'll be sure that we can an, uh, ask that. Um, Grafton, Massachusetts, awesome. Touchstone Community School, so glad to have you aboard. I'm a Mass native, so I have, I have a special uh, spot in my heart for everything Massachusetts and the Commonwealth. One other thing that I uh, I would like to mention while we're while we're waiting for the um, for our friends on board the expedition to reconnect. Um, is that we also have uh, um, two of our colleagues on board um, who are taking who are are taking part in today's uh, who are taking part in today's uh, video conference um, that are actually from that are actually tuning in from Cambodia. So my colleagues Lizzie and and Brianna um, they are just completing an expedition um, down the Mekong River in Cambodia. They'll be back uh, here in New York next week. Um, but but we but I, I did want to mention that they are uh, we have expeditions of all kinds and, and of all things. Um, and um, and I, I think that's a really nice thing to to cite. So. Um, <laughs> and and Lizzie's saying hello from Cambodia. Um, it's actually they're eleven hours ahead of us here on Easter time. So so Lizzie is uh, in particular is it's over eleven p.m. and she still wanted to take part in this really wonderful opportunity. Um, let's see, let's see. All right, these are some great questions uh, from um, from you all. This is really wonderful. Okay. Um, now, while we're waiting, <laughs> while we're waiting, uh, I will I will have a chance right now to. Um, uh, I'm just going to unmute a couple of you so we can we can chat um, we can chat more directly while uh, while we are waiting for our friends to return. Um, so since since you are since you are first, I'm going to unmute. Um, I'll unmute you guys first. So, Hi. hello, Hi. hello, welcome. So, I have a I have a question for you. I have a question for you. What do you think is the most interesting thing that you have learned about the Weddell Sea so far? If someone can raise their hand and tell and tell the the rest of us. Gus. Oh, that's a good one. All right, one one other person. Kaylee. Um, I think it's that uh, that um, I didn't know that Ernest Shackleton boat crashed his boat in the iceberg. 
Yeah, Ernest Shackleton, uh, along with many explorers, it's very easy to get trapped in the ice. And, and actually, he didn't crash his ship in the iceberg. I know a lot of us probably know the story of the Titanic, which, which wasn't able to, that wasn't able to actually uh, miss hitting the iceberg. But actually, Shackleton, his, his ship got stuck in the ice. So they, it was trying to sail its way through the ice, just like, just like a, lot of, um, a lot of ships that have to, that, that are in that part of the world do, except that the ice froze around his ship. And, and unfortunately, the weather got so bad that it actually slowly closed in. And so he and his men had to get off, get off the ship. Otherwise, the, the, ship, the ship would have sank, which it did. And over 100 years ago, that ship sank, and no one has been able to find it since. So we're very, very hopeful that, that during the expedition that is happening right now, we'll be able to find it. Uh, so thank you so much for, share, for sharing those questions. I am going to. Uh, I'm going to to open it up to another classroom. Mm -hmm. um, um, hello. 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 <laughs> hello. All right. All right. So, so, what's can someone tell me one thing that you found really interesting so far about the expedition? All right, Jared. Uh, I think it's really interesting that you guys are you know going through kind of unexplored territory. I think that's really interesting. Hope you find some interesting stuff. I, I agree. Now I'm gonna put myself on mute one second, um, just because I have the ship calling me on another. All right. So we're gonna do things a little bit creatively because we have to do what we can when we can. Um, now. Now, with the with the expedition, um, with the expedition, we unfortunately lost the the video on board the ship. But um, but they have called me, and that we're going to try and I'm going to try and patch them in through voice right now. Um, so um, we're we're going to do our best to do that right now, and. Um, Unfortunately, again, we've lost them a little bit. Yeah, if everyone takes a look at the, um, if everyone takes a look at the ch at the chat, um, uh, another one of my colleagues, Heather Halstead, she's actually our executive director and um, and the individual who founded Reach the World. Um, she has a really great idea. If any everyone can take this opportunity to discuss in their classrooms the technologies that make communication with the ship possible, we'll bring everyone else back online. Um, we'll bring everyone online uh, in a moment. Okay, so we're waiting to hear back from the expedition, um, but I think these are some really good questions that um, that I think will, will be good for us to discuss. So, um, can so I'm going to pick a class and and I'm going to ask you to answer answer one of the questions that um, that that Heather put on on here, which is, does anyone know how satellite communications work? Uh, so let's see here. Does anyone know how satellite communications work? Who am I going to ask? What classroom it looks like? Um, yeah. All right. Okay. So, so how does satellite communications work? Here we go. Yep, you guys. Oh. Yeah, it's you. Who's got an idea? Maybe like Eleanor. You have to speak a little bit louder, okay? I think I think I heard I think I heard the correct answer in there. So, <laughs> um, so there are a, a quite a few numbers of different satellites all over. Uh, all over the world, in fact, and they're constantly in orbit 
um, of Earth. And, and so there are different devices, uh, some, some very, very powerful and expensive, some very, very common. And each of those devices uh, are able to, to help people communicate. Now, um, now, I, for example, have a cell phone. And a cell phone is an example of, of one such device. Now, what they're using on board the ship is far more advanced, far more specialized than that. Um, and as Tim has, um, has put in the chat right now, that there are specific times during the day, um, there are specific times during the day that um, where, where the ship actually has to kind of tell everyone, no one can communicate using satellite, internet, or anything because the, the ship needs to send all of the important data that they've been collecting, all of the scientific research that they've been doing, and, and they need to upload it. So no one else is able to communicate, no one's allowed to go on, on and check their email or anything just for just to be able to make sure that all of that important scientific information gets off of the ship and to the to other scientists who can help uh, understand what the scientists on board have found. So, um, so I, I see a really good question here about the crew playing soccer when they arrived. That is a really yep. <laughs> that is a really great question. Um, so the. So the, the ship did, um, they did play soccer, and that was in honor of what happened over 100 years ago when, uh, when Ernest Shackleton and his crew with the, on board the Endurance, when they first arrived. Um, they actually, uh, the expedition, uh, they wanted to recreate that same experience. And so, uh, and so we, we, uh, we at Reach the World, we shared some ima uh, an image that was the original, uh, some of the original photos from over a hundred years ago that that uh, was of expedi uh, the expedition from Shackleton and his crew, uh, and then also with the with the the later one. I'm not sure if they're planning on playing on any other outdoor sports. Uh, I think now they're they're just about at the point where they're going to start doing a lot of the more advanced scientific experiments. So I'm not sure how much time they'll have to do that, but. I, I do know that, that they do have some downtime on board where they might want to do some, some fun things because even though they're working really hard, you don't always want to have to work. So that is, um, that is, that is something we can ask them if we can get them back online today. Uh, we may not be able to, and that's okay because, because like I said before, they're in the midst of sea trials and they need to uh, and those folks, they need to they need to use the internet for really important things. Now, uh, let's see, let's see. Um, I'm going to unmute. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to unmute you guys, your class. Uh, hello. Hi. Hi welcome. Um, we're still waiting for our, our friends in the, in the Weddell Sea to try and rejoin us. It is, uh, they're encountering some technological difficulties. Um, but where are you guys calling in from? Illinois. All right. We got a great Illinois contingent today. All right. <laughs> so, in, um, so, so we had someone ask, um, we had someone ask, there's an important difference between um, satellite and cellular, and who can explain an example? Who can explain an example? Do you guys know what the difference? No. It's okay if you don't. This is, it's all Lila, about who can guess. Try, wanna try Lila? Satellite. Loud. Okay, so one of our students thinks that you can put a satellite in multiple places. Okay, anyone Absolutely. else have an idea? John, so, do you have an idea? I, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm going to have to mute you all again because we have Holly back um, and I want to make sure <laughs> that, we have, that we have the chance to hear from Holly. So I'm going to unmute you guys and see. Hello, can you all hear us? Give me a wave if you can hear us. Thumbs up, yay! <laughs> We got there in the end. Oh, it's quite dark, actually. Too dark. Too dark, a little no. bit too dark. 
So we are live from Antarctica, and this is such a sign of how remote we are. It's a miracle that we even have internet connection out here. Um, we are in the one of the most remote places on our globe. Um, and I'm with two polar experts. This is my first time, so I'm learning everything from these two. I've got John Shears here, who's the voyage leader. Hiya. And Captain Knowledge Bengu, who is our sea ice expert and navigator. Um, mm. So what I'll do is I will first off pass you over to voyage leader John Shears, who has been to Antarctica many times before, and he'll just give you a little bit of background. Over right. to you, John. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> All right, I'm John Shears. I come from Cambridge in England. Uh, I'm the voyage leader. This is my 23rd time to Antarctica, so I know it quite well. I think I've spent nearly two years of my life living here, so I, I really quite like it. This is my second home, um, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm running all the expedition logistics and operations. So I've been working on this project for nearly two years now. So I'm very excited that we're here in Antarctica and that we've got this amazingly uh, remote location uh, deep in the far south at the bottom of the world, a place called the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf. Only four vessels have ever been here before. So everything that we're collecting, all the science samples that we're doing, it's all absolutely brand new. We're brand new to science is the work that we're doing. So and the, at the moment, we're doing sea trials with our uh, various bits of uh, Equipment. We've had uh, uh, little submarines going into the water uh, to check their systems and in a couple of days time we'll start the science program proper. That's me, I'm John Shears, so I'll hand you over to Captain Knowledge Bengu, he's the down, master Captain. of the vessel. So. Captain, so you have the seat. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Knowledge Bengu, I come from Devon in South Africa. I started my seagoing career in 2001, and it was my very first voyage coming down to Antarctica. This is my 11th time to Antarctica. So since 2001, I've worked my way through the ranks between various vessels, but I had a very special interest in Antarctic and polar regions. So I decided to make a career out of, out of it. Hence, I am here now, and today I'm a master. I've been a master since 2013, and this is my third voyage as a captain, and I've done two voyages as ice pilot. So I have five years of um, sort of being in command or assisting the master in two years, and then three years in being in command. Um, it's quite a very interesting job and very stressful job mm -hmm. to be in command, especially very, working with very uh, demanding and fussy individuals. You know, the vessel that we own, it takes about 100 people, and I've got 44 staff. So, in most times, we are about 150 people on board. So, currently, I have about what, 93 lives that I'm responsible for, which is currently on board, excluding myself. I'm quite uh, happy that I managed to take the vessel from Penguin Bukta to the Weddell Sea and to be part of this expedition. It's actually a highlight of my career. Um, I'm just looking forward to accomplish both objectives of this voyage, which is firstly uh, to do science around the Lassen Sea and then if there is time, possibly go to an endurance site. So if all boxes are ticked, I'll be quite delighted and be the proudest captain in the universe. Yes. And I know, as you can see, most of you can see how bright the light is on us. Um, I don't know if you know, but in Antarctica, there's 24 hours of daylight. So we've got a very strong white light and ice coming in from us, which is why you can see us all kind of a bit washed out. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Captain Knowledge is the man in charge on the vessel. Everything has to be passed through him. Anything that we want to be done goes through John and Captain Knowledge. So actually, you guys are very lucky to be in the presence of the people in charge of the expedition. <laughs> and 
Yeah, so like Captain Knowledge said, we arrived at the Larsen Sea yesterday, and that's where we're going to be doing our first leg of the expedition, and that's the scientific program. Um, so I'm sure John will be able to give us a bit more information on this, but we have the some of the best scientists from all over the world on this vessel right now. John, you want to give a bit of science? Okay, so, so the science that we're trying, trying to do here is that... Yeah. <laughs> we're going to do a bit of shuffling now. Shuffling around. And we're, in a, we're in John's cabin currently. Yeah, so, so there's not much room because I'm, we're in, in my cabin. We're actually we're on, we're on, board, on board the ship. I think it's a bit too dark. It's a bit too dark. Let's try that. There yeah. we are. There we go. Okay. So we've, we arrived at the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf yesterday. We're testing all of our equipment today and tomorrow. And then the day after, that's when the science will start. It'll be very, very exciting because what we're trying to do is to use our underwater robots to go under the ice shelf. The ice shelf is a huge, huge floating glacier, and no one has ever tried to see what is living underneath this ice shelf or this big floating glacier. No one knows what's living on the sea floor. Uh, no one knows the, what the, uh, the sediments are like there, what the rocks are. Uh, it's all, it will all be brand new to science. Uh, we'll be here for about uh, two weeks, doing that, collecting all sorts of samples using our underwater robots. Yes, and we've just seen that a question's come in from Christine. So hi, Christine, in the classroom. Um, we've just seen that you've asked, we're wondering if your crew collects DNA samples from animals. Hello, everyone in Christine's classroom. Uh, um, the answer to that is yes, we do. Yes. So we have underwater robots that have kind of like com com almost like a PlayStation controlled by a remote from the surface. They go under the water, very, very deep, and they have claws on them, and they can collect samples from the seabed. So yes, to your answer, we do collect DNA samples from animals. <laughs> so I, I, there was a question from earlier that I, I wanted to bring back. Um, there was a, a teacher who asked, who was asking, how many miles have you, has this, has this expedition um, gone and how long has that taken? Um, now I know that that we've talked a little bit about through some of the articles that that there there are kind of two separate journeys. That there's how most of the expedition uh, scientists have gotten on board the the ship, and then there's also how how the ship got to to Penguin Butka. So if you can talk a little bit about that, I think that would be really a really good thing. Okay. To share. So so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we got to the vessel. And then Knowledge will talk a bit about our journey on the vessel to get to the Larsen Sea. So we've, we've got people who've come on the expedition from all over the world. We have people from America, uh, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Ireland. We even have somebody from Russia, uh, Norway. It's a very, very multinational expedition uh, because, as Holly said, we've got the very best people in the world who have come with us. So we've selected people for their science, scientific uh, research uh, expertise and also for their technical uh, and engineering skills. So we have people from all over the world. So there are uh, 41 people on the expedition. So everyone came from around the world. They all flew into Cape Town at the uh, southern end of South Africa. And that's where we all met. And then we flew to Antarctica. Right? It's quite an unusual way to get to Antarctica because there, there are no proper airports in Antarctica. But we flew. We, we took a small jet aircraft and we flew from Cape Town to, and we landed on a glacier, if you believe that. that you can actually, in Antarctica, the glaciers uh, are so big that you can land a jet aircraft on them. And that's what we did. It was fantastic. Very I'm, exciting. Very, very exciting. Um, that. Because the glasses are so big, so flat, it doesn't matter that you can't use your brakes. You've just, you just let the aircraft gradually run to a halt, uh, which is what we did. And then we got off that jet aircraft and then we swapped to uh, a very old aircraft called a Basler, a twin engined uh, aircraft, which is a very old design from the Second World War over 50 years ago. So this aircraft called the Basler then took us from our ice runway, and it took us to the, uh, the Thimble ice shelf, which is where Penguin Bookter is, and this is where the South African vessel, the Agulhas 2, picked us up. 
So our traveling journey from Cape Town to Penguin Bookta of, I think for the quickest we did it in was uh, about 11 hours. But some of our people got stuck on routes and they had to stay in various camps. So Holly was one of those. Yep. The other people in our group, <laughs> they took uh, as long as uh, nearly 20 hours to get to the ship. Um, and then when we got to the ship, to the, uh, where the aircraft dropped us off, and some of us then used a helicopter to go from the ice shelf onto the ship, short ride of five minutes or so, but very spectacular flying over the vessel, seeing the vessel from the air for the first time. But then some others, we, we couldn't use the helicopters, so some other people had to go from the ice shelf onto the vessel using what's called a, a, a rope basket dangling from a crane. So some people were on this rope basket and they were, what it would have been, what, uh, 20, 30 meters up in the air. So yeah. we're talking the size of a, a small block of flats, but they were coming down from the ice shelf and then coming down on the rope basket. I think that there was a photo on my blog of the basket of being lifted for, by a crane onto the vessel. So that's, the, that's what John's talking about right now, is that basket that lifted us from the ice shelf onto the vessel. It was quite nerve wracking. <laughs> I've also seen that you guys have asked some questions just down the side, which we could answer while we're, we're pausing before Knowledge talks about our transit to where we are now on the vessel. So the first question is from Eileen. Hi, Eileen and class. Um, you said, if there's 24 hours of sunlight every day, how do you sleep? Quite a good question. Um, in our cabins, we all have blinds and curtains, and everybody has attached Velcro to their curtains so that we can block out the sunlight so that everybody can try and get sleep. I've also bought an eye mask that I wear all the time. Otherwise, you just lose kind of sense of what's day and what's night. But, but I'm so used to coming to Antarctica that I don't have any problems at all. No. I often sleep in my cabin here with all the, all the, all no. the curtains open. Yeah. Whoa. See, that's a seasoned polar <laughs> traveller. I'm not like that. I, I have to have pitch black. <laughs> um, the other question you've asked is, have you ever discovered anything like parts of the ship in the sea? Um, this is from Christine. Uh, yes, most people on, there are some people on this... Um, vessel who actually work as a job to find shipwrecks in the ocean. That's kind of my primary job. So yes, the answer to that is I have found shipwrecks in the ocean before, um, but that's a whole other story as well. We'll have to come back to it. I'll write a blog about it, guys. Um, so we'll just go on to knowledge to talk about our journey from Penguin Bookta to the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf. Hi everyone again. Um, yeah, from Penguin Bookta, once I uh, received uh, all 41 people on board, it was on the third. So I had to do a compulsory passenger briefing and also do an abandoned ship lifeboat master, which include everybody in case of emergency. Um, we left on the third. We we're full away on ice passage around 1500. So beforehand, we had to do a lot of preparation where we had to look at ice imagery. Uh, just to work um, our passage and passing through multi-year ice that was along the way as we were proceeding north. So we spent about uh, 15 hours going through very thick um, ice, which is multi-year ice, and the vessel can do about five knots in one meter thick ice. Um, that's the design of the vessel, but she far exceeds um, that specification. So along the way, we managed to only go towards the open water where we could include the, the vessel has four engines, um, so which we, it's a setting called ice mode, which we normally use for backing and ramming or going through very thick ice. However, if you're on this mode, you can also do about 18 knots. So we managed to do a very good speed and cover a lot of miles uh, during the time when we were in ice mode, which shortened up our transit time. But um, the general rule in ice navigation, it says if you can avoid the ice, then avoid it, which is what we've done. Only when it was necessary to go through quite a light uh, uh, patches of ice um, so that we could then get here in a record time. 
Um, the distance is about 2,500 nautical miles uh, from Penguin Bukta to the Lassen Sea. Um, towards the, like the last 24 hours in, uh, to, to the Lassen Sea, we came across very thick uh, multi-year ice, but lots of water in between. So we spent a lot of time just uh, zigzagging or just uh, doing a lot of post alterations to avoid the ice or also uh, so that we can also avoid to damage the vessel. So we then myself and the ice pilot is on board. We were 24 hours where we work six on six off. Unfortunately, I can't stay awake <laughs> for 24 hours. <laughs> so, um, that's how then we managed to get the vessel safely to the last and see. I've just seen another question come in that I think is quite interesting, is about how often do you receive new supplies? So I don't know if you guys saw, but um, I did a post about the food that we have on board the vessel, which is actually very impressive. So we left South Africa on December the 6th and have not had a restock of food since then. But we are still having delicious meals of chicken and potatoes and vegetables because we've stocked up enough food to last us maybe till the 11th of March. So there's a lot of food on this vessel. That uh, planning, uh, it's actually a very intense planning because you cannot work out um, who will eat and who will not eat in a particular day. But what is very critical is that you, you know, you, you, our freezers have special filters that just uh, helps to prolong the fresh and fresh fruits and vegetables uh, to last at least for about two months. Soon in the next few weeks, we'll definitely run out of uh, fresh produce, not because we can't stock it, but it's just the shelf life. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, any other dry um, food and canned stuff and frozen veggies, we will be able to have until the vessel is safely back to Cape Town mid-March. Mm. And there's another really interesting question. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I, there, was, there was a question that was asked earlier in the chat um, that I, I wanted to make sure that that was asked. It was about downtime because uh, some of the students had seen the picture of you all playing soccer uh, on, uh, or, or football, <laughs> um, uh, on the ice. And they were wondering if there were any other sports that you were planning on playing. And, and, and then to the second question would be about downtime. So what, what is it that you do in downtime, uh, I mean, aside from sleep? Um, are there other games or other things to do um, when you're when you're not working, which obviously is is a lot of what you do. <laughs> so, uh, so as well as playing the football match, we played the football match on the first of January, and uh, that was to pay homage to the explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton because he also played football with his crew over a hundred years ago on the first of January, nineteen fifteen, and some of the photos that Holly took are actually. Uh, recreate images which uh, Shackleton's photographer uh, Frank Hurley took. So we we played football. Uh, we we've also got to, we have a, a helicopter hangar. We have no helicopters with us, so we use the hangar for uh, table tennis. There was a uh, there's a table tennis competition running on the vessel at the moment. Yep. And in the hangar, they've also got a, a volleyball volleyball net. So we're going to be playing volleyball as well. We have lots of board games, things like chess and backgammon on board that people can do in the evenings. And we quite often have um, films, but uh, they, they tend to be about Antarctica. People can't just get enough of Antarctica. So we've been watching a film about Shackleton and, and some documentaries. So, uh, so we do that. And then people, um, they can watch uh, the, the, the ship on its computers. It has a huge film library. I think they have over 3,000 films on their, uh, on their computers here. So you can basically choose any film that you want to watch um, when you've got a bit of, bit of downtime. But for me, because I'm the voyage leader, I tend to have to work a lot, a lot, a lot of the time. So I'm currently sleeping about three to four hours a day because there's just so much to do to make sure that uh, we uh, continue to fulfill our uh, expedition objectives and also to make sure that everyone's safe on board the vessel. So. Knowledge and I share that sort of res that responsibility that uh, nothing goes wrong, everything's safe, and we get everyone home safe and sound at the end of the expedition. Yeah, 
And so these two are kind of never really have time for downtime. I know Knowledge goes to the gym quite a lot. We have a gym on board. Um, and we also have a soft drinks bar. So everybody does convene at about eight in the evening for a nice can of Coca-Cola um, all together. And we play board games, uh, which is great fun. Um, the other thing that, that, despite the connection that we have here, nobody on the vessel has access to any social media. So there's no Facebook, there's no Instagram, there's none of that. And it's quite refreshing. Everyone's reading, everyone's playing games, everyone's really interacting together. Um, and it gets very competitive. We actually have the Weddell Sea Olympics going on right now, um, which started yesterday with the table tennis championships, which I'm proud to say I won three games of. Um, <laughs> And next week we're doing volleyball and the week after we're going to do a darts championship. So there is plenty to do in downtime. So one of the things that uh, I want to do, because I'm from England, is that we have a game of cricket. So mm -hmm. that's probably, probably very unusual to people in America. In America but, uh, but they play cricket in South Africa and they play cricket in England. So we'll probably have a South Africa versus England cricket match on the ice. Mm -hmm. Or in Chicago. Yeah. We normally set up you know, the cricket. Nice. Yeah. Just, just, for, just in case you guys didn't know, when we reference something like a hangar or a hold, that's the hangar is an open space at the back of the vessel. So it's it's where the helicopter is usually held. It's a big open room um, that has enough space to to host a, a small football match, soccer match. And the hold is where uh, all the supplies are kept. So that so when knowledge was talking about the food, that's kept there. Um, all, the, all the different supplies for uh, the station that they, that they supply cargo to, that's all kept in the hold. Mm -hmm. And I've seen another good question. Um, I know that quite a few have come through, but there's one that says, like astronauts, do you need to get special training? This is quite a good question. Um, when you go offshore, you have to pass a health and safety examination. Um, and there's also a sea survival course that you have to do. So everybody has to do it depends it can vary from general sea survival techniques and what to do in working as a team when you're in the water to keep each other warm but um i had quite an exciting and i think most people here had the training of um what to do in a helicopter emergency so we were put in a helicopter simulator plunked into the water flipped upside down and we had to escape from this helicopter simulator so we do have quite intensive training to go through in order to work offshore yeah. and on my course we had to learn how to fight a fire mm -hmm. on board a ship so uh, i was dressed up like a fireman with a fireman's hat and i had to use learn how to use hoses to put out fires because a fire on a vessel is a very very dangerous thing so or everyone might get involved in fighting that fire so you have to learn it as part of your training mm -hmm. and then another question that perhaps john could answer is from Strengths, who said, when you go outside, what gear do you wear and how much does it weigh? Okay, well, we're very fortunate in that uh, we have uh, very good uh, warm weather gear with us. So what we do is we, we have layers of clothing. So we have uh, a base layer, what's called a base layer. So this is a, a warm t-shirt and, uh, and, and fleece trousers. Then you'd have a, a mid layer, uh, another set of fleece, fleece t-shirt, fleece trousers. And then you have an outer layer of uh, uh, something like Gore-Tex, uh, a, a very tough material for your outer coat. So that's how you keep warm. You have lots of lots of layers that keeps uh, um, air between those layers, which acts as an insulator. And with the, with, with the gear that we've got, we don't get cold at all. It's it's very good. Um, and if we if people are cold, then we can come back on board the vessel and, and get warmed up. So uh, no, we don't have any problems with. Um, with the gear and how much does it weigh? Probably only a couple of kilograms. It's not, it's not that heavy at all. Um, we, but one thing that we do have to have um, and be very careful about is uh, about uh, the sun. The sun is very bright here in Antarctica. It gets reflected off the snow and the ice, but also in Antarctica, there's very little ultraviolet radiation. So you can get very, very bad sunburn. So whenever we go outside, we have to make sure we have sunblock on. Um, because if you get burnt, it could be uh, very, very painful for you. And there's another really good question from Christine as well about, do you ever use submarines in your expedition? So this is what's really exciting about the Weddell Sea Expedition is we are using autonomous underwater vehicles, otherwise known as AUVs. And these are 
long um, cylindrical shaped, they look a bit like torpedoes and they go under the water up to 5,000 meters and they scan the ocean bed for any irregularities. They also have a camera on them. So we're using them for this science that we're doing and also to hopefully if we get there, locate the wreck of the endurance. So I guess kind of they're autonomous submarines in a, I'll write a blog about it and explain what they are. Yeah, basically they're unmanned. <laughs> You know, the, nobody from the expedition is going under the water. We're using the robots to go under the water for us, and they have cameras and sensors, sensors to tell us about the environment. So um, I know that there are still a, a few questions that are coming in through the chat, but before, but I, I did want to give a chance for um, some of the classrooms to actually be able to ask questions directly. Uh, so. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to unmute one of the classrooms right now and give, give uh, one or two of the students a chance to, to talk to you directly. So, um, so uh, Mr. Whitney, I'm going to unmute your class first since, um, since you guys, you all are... Um, Hello. Yeah. We can see you on the screen. Awesome. Um, let me just... Hi. Hi. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay. So, does any uh, any of you have a have a question to ask us our, our wonderful guests today? Yes. Hi. Um, I heard you and mentioned food itself earlier, but do you guys know what it's like cooking on the ship? Do we know what? Do you mind repeating the question? Sorry. Like what's cooking? What is it like? Cooking on the ship. Is it like cooking on the ship? This one for knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the ship is almost like a five star hotel. She is a passenger <laughs> ship. <laughs> the passenger ship, she complies with the passenger class regulations. She's a tanker. <coughs> She's a container ship. She's a bulk carrier. She's a helicopter platform. So, mm -hmm. if you have an idea how a, a five star hotel looks like, we are on a floating five star hotel. <laughs> <laughs> it, I imagine that when we're through rough seas, it'd be quite difficult to cook those. So they're very, very skilled chefs on here, and they also are very good at using the supplies that they have. Uh, one more, yeah, one more question from Mr. Whitney's class, and then we'll go to another one. Are there penguins? <laughs> did you did you guys hear that? No. 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 One more time. <laughs> Are there, Are there penguins? painting penguins? Penguins. Oh, loads yes, of penguins. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so we've seen two species of penguin whilst we've been uh, on this expedition. So we've seen uh, the uh, daily penguin, and we've also seen the emperor penguin. Uh, daily penguins are quite small, and they're about, um, I suppose, about one one foot one foot tall. But emperor penguins are very big. They're more like three or four feet tall. So we've seen both of those penguins. We've seen quite a few. We often see them floating on uh, ice floes as we travel past on the ship. So yesterday morning, we got woken up by an announcement on the ship saying that there was a leopard seal. So I woke up by opening my curtains and seeing a seal out of my window. It was amazing. Wonderful. That's great. All right, I'm going to unmute one more classroom. Um. <laughs> Hello, Christina. All right. Um, so, um, so can we have um, can we have a uh, one or two volunteers who can be who be willing to ask a question? Are you moving right now? Great question. No, no, we're not moving right now. We've. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're keeping the, the ship stationary so we can test our equipment. That's the robots. We're testing the robots right now, so the ship has to be still. <laughs> okay, one more. One more. Lois, loud Oh, um... What was one of the questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, loud and proud. Are the penguins friendly? Are the, friendly? are the penguins friendly? Uh, they're they're very inquisitive. Um, normally, we don't we we don't want to disturb them or 
harm them in, in any way. So we tend to just walk very carefully around them. Um, but uh, when we were playing our football match, we had to stop the football match because we had a pitch invasion by 30 penguins. So we had to stop and let the penguins go across our football field. And then when they'd gone, then we could re <laughs> restart the football. Uh, and then one of the other expedition members, a penguin took a dislike to her. She was one of, one of the students on the expedition. And this penguin was pecking her leg. And um, yeah. she was trying to get, she was running away from the penguin. So the penguin was, a, was attacking her. But it didn't hurt her. Penguins can't, <laughs> penguins can't really hurt you. But they can certainly peck you a bit. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, well one experience for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, okay, so I've unmuted uh, our next classroom, so. Um, um, what is it like to be really far away from your family? Mm, great question. Oh. What is it like to be really far from? What is it like to be really, really far, far from? From your family. Oh, well, these two are probably very, very used to it. Yeah. Um, you, I've only been working offshore for a year now. Um, it is at times, we're quite lucky because we have WhatsApp, so we can message home. I can talk to my mum and dad over WhatsApp. Um, but I think because we're in such a fantastic and exciting place, and there's always so much going on, you are always, always occupied with work to do and games to play. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a long way from home, but it's very, very exciting. And the work that we're doing is really worthwhile. So it, it, it kind of makes it all worthwhile. Uh, do you sign up or do you get paid? You get paid. Well, I'll, I'll talk about the expedition first and then Knowledge can talk about the ship. So for the expedition, we invited people to uh, come on the expedition because we wanted the very best people in the world whether they were scientists or technical people. So we didn't select people, we actually went out and invited uh, uh, special, special people to come on the expedition with us. All right, so for me, um, when I decided to come to see as many of uh, my colleagues who also had a desire to work on the ships, uh, and for, uh, well, fortunately for us, uh, we happened to be on the polar expedition vessels, so we decided to specialize on it. So that's how then um, we ended up coming down here many times. The only downside uh, in my career, especially when it involves the Antarctica, is that you miss Christmas all the time when you're down here. So since 2001, I've only had uh, four Christmases at home uh, with my family, so which means I've missed the rest. So you can do the maths, you smart kids. <laughs> <laughs> wow, um, that's I, I can imagine if that 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 would be difficult. Um, so we're gonna go we're gonna go right into our next classroom. Um, Hello, Christine's classroom. <laughs> All right. Scourges. Yeah. Okay. Sydney, what's your question? Okay, so students asking, what is the most fun thing that you've done on the ship? Do we have another question that we can Wait, ask at the I, same time? I do. Ben. Are you ever scared your ship is going to sink like the Titanic? Okay, <laughs> let's maybe, um, That's actually we could ask that question, but we're obviously wishing you only good things. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sink. <laughs> but are you afraid that yeah. the ship might come into dangerous terrain or um, sink? So, so the most uh, fun thing that uh, I've done, I think, was the, the football game and uh, going on to the ice because we played the game on frozen sea ice. So frozen sea ice is frozen seawater. So it's very unusual to be able to do that. Um, although I've been to Antarctica so many times, I've only ever been able to do, uh, to walk on fast ice like that twice. So that was a big fun thing to do. And then... Um, are you scared your ship is going to sink? No, no. This is a this is a very 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 uh, tough. Uh, it's a very very safe vessel. Knowledge is a fantastic captain, 
So no, I don't, I'm not scared at all. Okay, uh, just to add on what John has said, we learn from the mistakes of the past, so the vessel has double skin. So before you get to the actual hull for the vessel, you've got voids. So if we do puncture the, the, the very first layer, the hull, the water will only um, fill up the one void. So the ship is segregated or separated in so many compartments so that if one is flooded, she can still remain afloat. Awesome. That that's that's actually very helpful, and I'm think and I'm sure that many many of uh, of the classrooms that are following along will be very pleased to know that that you guys are very safe. <laughs> um, so I'm going to unmute Mr. Rogers um, and see. So Mr. Rogers, um, are you ready to ask a question? How long ago? Um, okay. Last night. Maybe not. <laughs> um, we'll go to Miss uh, Sostak. <laughs> Hello, so sex class. Uh, hey. Fine. Nora, are there polar bears? Are there polar bears? Are there polar bears? No, no. Po polar bears live in the Arctic. So polar bears live at the northern end of the world. We're at the other end of the world. We're at the South Pole, and only uh, only penguins live live here. How much fuel does your boat need? How much fuel does your boat need? Mm. Great. Oh, the, 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 sh the ship, when uh, sh she's filled up completely, like to the brim, she takes uh, 3.6 million liters. That's full capacity of the fuel. Oh, no. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Actually, drive a normal motor car for 85 years with the amount of fuel that we take. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, let's see, um, Miss Richards' class. Hi. Hello, Miss Richards' class. Uh, <laughs> If one of you gets a disease, do you have uh, medical supplies on your boat to help? That's a great question. Cure you. Yeah. Well, the ship is equipped with a, a full-on hospital uh, with lots of medicine. Unfortunately, we don't have every type, but the, we have a doctor on board as well, a qualified medical doctor. Our hospital has got four beds and uh, with surgery and a consultation room. So yeah, we're safe. Very cool. Right. Um, very very experienced. How does your boat go through the ice? How does your boat go through the ice? <laughs> <laughs> okay, firstly, the way the ship is designed, she's designed so to climb on top of the ice and she has a very strong metal uh, almost to the keel which we call the ice knife so you need a lot of power to push through the ice and when that happens the ice knife cracks the ice and we use the bodily weight or the bodily mass of the vessel to then uh, crush the ice and then that's how we pass through wow that's fascinating um that's really wonderful so um i so these have been some really wonderful questions and I appreciate everyone uh, being so patient as we got our technological ducks in a row. Um, I, I want to, to, um, to give um, to John um, and, and Knowledge and, and Holly one more chance if there's anything else that you want to share with the classrooms. Um, I'll, I'll give you the last word and then, um, and then we'll, um, I'll, I'll unmute everyone, give them a chance to say, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll conclude. So is, is there anything else that you'd want to? We were just, yeah. We were just thinking we're going to try and turn the laptop around so you can see out of our window, so you can see the polar ice. So let me just try and do that. Bear with me a little bit. Okay. So you can see that there's a bright, bright light coming through. Can you, are you all there? Can, can you give me a wave to show that you can still hear me? Okay, yep, yeah. all right. I don't know if it's, is it, can you see? 
can see. Wow. Right. Bright, or can you all see that? We saw it. Hey! <laughs> 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 Um, that, um, that, that was, was pretty amazing. Um, so I'm going to unmute everyone to give everyone a chance to at once say goodbye and thank you. Um, so <laughs> be, be prepared for that. Um, and then after that, we will conclude. Um, but before, before I do that, I just want to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation for all three of you being willing to take part. Uh, and, and chat with us today and, and from, from all of us here at Reach the World and all of our partner educators, those who are able to come and then also those who, who weren't able to come, uh, to come this morning. Um, just thank you for being willing to let us follow along on this just incredible adventure. Um, so, I'll, so I'll let everyone else on the count of three say thank you. So one, two, three. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.